one side or the other. One side or the other is going to win. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there can be a, 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 a way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really can't be compromised. You know, really can't be compromised. So it's not like we're going to split the difference. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just, I think that the solution really is like winning the moral argument. Like people in this country who believe in God have got to keep fighting for that to return our country to a place of, of godliness. Oh, I agree with you. The independent judiciary is foundational to the survival of America's democracy. And the rule of law is under siege from an enemy within. And there is no enemy with a sharper knife aimed at the heart of the rule of law in America than Justice Samuel Alito, a man who is aggrieved and angry and intellectually corrupt to the core. He is a political partisan, radicalized by the MAGA era. It is Tuesday, June the 11th, 2024, 147 days out from the U.S. presidential election, where the last of the votes will be cast. This is The Warning, and I'm Steve Schmidt. Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel A. Alito have lit the reputation of the Supreme Court of the United States on fire. They are judicial arsonists who have betrayed their oath with their lack of ethics, with their political extremism, and their abdication of the concept that judges aren't supposed to take sides in politics. The magnitude of the scandal at hand is difficult to overstate. Justice Roberts, whose confirmation I led, like I led Samuel Alito's, 20 years ago, talked about the importance of the rule of law at his confirmation hearings. He mentioned that the Soviet Constitution had all of the rights that you could find in the American Constitution, except that there was no tradition of a rule of law in the Soviet Union. Politics was the master of the law, and so Soviet Russia was a totalitarian state because absence law, there is only power. And when there is only power, absent restraint, there is chaos, there is death, and there is tyranny. The independent judiciary is foundational to the survival of America's democracy. And the rule of law is under siege from an enemy within. And there is no enemy with a sharper knife aimed at the heart of the rule of law in America than Justice Samuel Alito, a man who is aggrieved and angry and intellectually corrupt to the core. He is a political partisan, radicalized by the MAGA era. He is a man who sees the world in black and white, us and thems, and it's zero sum. Someone wins and someone loses. Let's listen to the most remarkable spoken words ever captured on a recording by a U.S. Supreme Court justice. Of course, these were recorded by Lauren Windsor, the activist and journalist who went to the Supreme Court Society dinner with a tape recorder on. What she heard that we have heard now is astounding and deeply, deeply troubling. In order to understand and to fully comprehend How radical Samuel Alito's comments are. Let's set a waypoint. And that is the answer that Chief Justice Roberts gives to Windsor's provocations. Let's start there and let's listen. Well, I guess I just, I believe that the founders were godly, like, we're we're, we're Christians. And I think that we live in a Christian nation and that our Supreme Court should be guiding us in that path. Yeah, I don't know that we live in a Christian nation. I know a lot of Jewish and Muslim friends who would say, maybe not. Uh, And it's not our job to do that. It's our job to decide the the cases as best we can. Compare that now to this. One side or the other. One side or the other is going to win. Uh, I I don't know. 
I mean, there can be a, 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 a way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really can't be compromised. You know, really can't be compromised. So it's not like we're going to split the difference. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just. I think that the solution really is like winning the moral argument. Like people in this country who believe in God have got to keep fighting for that to return our country to a place of, of godliness. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. Because we look at like the decline of our society, the decline of the nuclear family, and liberals, I just feel like want to see that happen and proliferate. And I think we've been too permissive to say, oh, you know, okay. I understand the Constitution. I understand my opponent. Samuel Alito's vision of the world. Us versus them. One side wins, and he's clearly on that side. The man is unfit. And so it has come to be that in a moment of growing political crisis, we face, as a country, one of the great judicial crises in our history, because the Supreme Court can no longer be viewed as a credible institution with the continued service of the corrupted judges, Alito and Thomas, from the bench, who have been rebuked in no form or fashion by anyone so far as an American citizen can see, not by the Chief Justice, not by the Congress, by nobody. And these people, like all Americans, are not above the law. This does demonstrate the absolute urgent moral necessity to amend the Constitution of the United States and to change the absurdity of life tenure to a shorter term, whether that be 10 years or 15 years or whatever. The service of 70 years on the Supreme Court by someone like Samuel Alito, with no recourse whatsoever with regards to his corruption, is simply unacceptable. Lauren Windsor also gained a lot of clarity around the flag issue. Apparently, Martha Alito thinks about flags very often. She is an aggressive, aggrieved, and angry woman, a type of super Karen, a Tyrannosaurus Rex of Karens, with sharpened teeth, ready to bite down on the thems and to get revenge. Let's listen to her talk to a perfect stranger with a lot of venom about a reporter who doesn't work for the New York Times, but rather the Washington Post, who wrote the story she's complaining about 20 years ago. The story she references with regard to Jane Roberts was a controversial piece where the fashion reporter mentioned the attire of the Roberts twins, who were toddlers at the time, but are now in their early 20s. You know, um, I was denigrated early on in, when we first came to town, and the woman then got, won a Pulitzer Prize. She was commenting on my clothes. She said that I wore a baby blanket one day, and the next time I had on a Lazy Boy recliner pattern suit, and so when she won her Pulitzer, I called her up and I said, hello, is this Robin Gavan of the New York Times? Yes, it is. I said, oh, I'm so proud of you. You're getting a Pulitzer Prize. I said, and will you be wearing Balenciaga? And she goes, no. I said, why not? She said, well, it doesn't flatter me. I said, oh, come on. Such a high-end thing. It doesn't flatter you. And then I said to her, you know, it's a beautiful day. It's April 2006. I said, maybe you want to go outside today in New York. It's really beautiful. Take a walk and enjoy life. She never came after me again, but she went after Jane Roberts again. That's why she got her poster between, between Jane and me, criticizing the clothes that Jane who put the children in and the clothes that we wore. I'm going to make a prediction. By this time tomorrow, the Robin Givon story that Martha Alito told will have been revealed to have been a figment of her imagination, completely made up. But what's not made up is her animus 
against gay people. Let's listen to that. I made a flag in my head. This is how I, I satisfy myself. I made a flag, it's white, and it's yellow and orange flames around it, and in the middle is the word vergogna. Vergogna in Italian means shame. Vergogna, V-E-R-G-O-G-N-A. Vergogna, shame, shame, shame on you. Verona, Verona. It's like a scene from a Godfather knockoff. But as it turns out, Martha Alito isn't Italian. She's German. I actually knew that because I ran the confirmation process. But let's hear her talk about being German. My heritage is German. You come after me, I'm going to give it back to you. And there will be a way. It doesn't have to be now, but there will be a way. They will know. Just don't worry about it. It's interesting what she latches on to. It isn't the history of German art or music or literature. She doesn't talk with shame about being stigmatized as a German by the actions of Germans 80 years ago. No? What she embraces is a German caricature for revenge, for reprisal, for mass execution, no doubt, for the legacy of Lidice. Let's listen to Martha Ann celebrate her Germanic roots, her zeal for line them against the wall for the reprisal, I suppose. You read the Bible. Psalm 27 is my song. Mine. Psalm 27. The Lord is my God and my rock. Of whom shall I be afraid? Revenge, anger, retribution. Let's listen to Martha Ann talk about getting people. You know what I want? I want a sacred heart of Jesus flag because I have to look across the lagoon at the pride flag for the next month. Exactly. And, and he's like, oh, please don't put up a flag. I said, I won't do it because I'm deferring to you. But when you are free of this nonsense, I'm putting it up and I'm going to send them a message every day. This is great news for America, isn't it? Soon, the Supreme Court, on a case that Justice Alito refuses to recuse himself from, will decide if Donald Trump has maximum power, the power to kill any American citizen that he chooses because presidents are truly above the law. That is the case that Trump is arguing it. And it seems from the Alito recordings that Alito, who has a worldview that one side wins and one side loses, would seem to appreciate the argument for absolute power where one side could kill the other. Nezpa, isn't that the logical conclusion? of the words of this embittered man, this man has become radicalized in the MAGA era. And there he sits on the bench for the rest of his life, beyond reach, with absolute impunity to do as he wishes, beyond the law, above the law. Are we to live under Alito's law? This is madness, must be opposed, and it must be stopped. And understand what Ever remedy to this is talked about, debated about, is appropriate. Expanding the size of the court is an appropriate debate. It must be, because the magnitude of the offense against the concepts to which Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas swore allegiance are profound, exceptional, and terrifying. When you listen to Martha Alito and her husband, Sam, you should understand that what these recordings prove, beyond a shadow of a doubt whatsoever, is the man described in all of the investigative pieces of journalism, in Politico, in ProPublica. All of them are dead on. How do we know? Because Sam Alito told us in his own words. And so what we have now is a crisis of the most severe magnitude a crisis of legitimacy affecting the Supreme Court of the United States of America at a time when the Supreme Court has found itself in the middle of adjudicating the culture war that has been unleashed on the country by the radicalism of the court itself. It is a truly amazing moment and a deeply dangerous one. Lauren Windsor did something exceptional. It took daring. It took guts. And this is the type of journalism that will be necessary to fight back and combat what is coming. Because on the public stage, these people are too clever by half. We live in a post-constitutional era where the emergency is so great, our culture so on fire, 
that we need to take a time out from all this liberty stuff, all this democracy. We just have to pick Trump. He'll fix everything for us. The Alitos may believe that. He may even abuse his power in his office to try to achieve it. But you should never fall for it because it is the greatest lie ever told. And let me say finally this. It's the person who ran that confirmation process for Samuel Alito almost 20 years ago. The magnitude of President Bush's mistake in appointing this man, the catastrophe of the mistake, is only rivaled and superseded by the Iraq war itself. Samuel Alito is unfit. He is unfit temperamentally. He is unfit psychologically. He is unfit by his words and deeds for service on the United States Supreme Court. But understand, his arrogance is so acute, his judgment so impaired, that he feels comfortable saying what he said out loud to Lauren Windsor on the occasion of their first meeting to a perfect stranger. And that's perfectly incredible. Samuel Alito is a political radical posing as a Supreme Court justice. And that means deep trouble ahead for all of us. If there is a narrow election victory that Joe Biden has won, understand that 147 days from now, the election will not be over. It will begin a process by which radicals like Samuel Alito work in the shadows behind the scenes, seeking to overturn it on the basis of a lie that they have now long subscribed to, and that they have pushed out over and over again, trying to poison the American mind. The lie is that the loser of the presidential election is really the winner, and he should have ultimate power to punish the people who dared vote against him. If you agree with this, if this resonates with you, hit your like button, subscribe to the warning, join the cause of liberty by being informed about what's happening. Every day, we'll tell you the truth about what's happening. I'm Steve Schmidt. This is The Warning. And I invite you to join, subscribe on our Substack, on our YouTube channel. Follow us. Welcome to the community.